Greetings everyone, my name is Adam Harriton and today I'm exploring one of my favorite places to explore, especially during the spring months. Now honestly, I like coming here any time of the year because who wouldn't love hanging out in an area that looks like this? So year-round explorations in these woods are always rewarding, but spring explorations are extra special for so many reasons, and in a few minutes, I'll show you why. So as you can see, the deciduous canopy has completely filled in with leaves, and within a few weeks, summer will be upon us. But signs of spring still abound. I'm doing my best to celebrate the season to its fullest as long as I possibly can because I know that there will never be another spring season quite like this one. So I've got my camera, there's a slight breeze in the air, it's a gorgeous day. I thought I'd show you around and show you a few plants that I think I'm in love with. Let's go take a walk. What's not to love about wild orchids? I absolutely love finding orchids in the wild, especially when they're in flower. And orchids are familiar to most of us because there are a lot of species in the Orchidaceae family, about 27,000 species worldwide. And it's estimated that about 10% of all flowering plants are in the orchid family. And so orchids grow in a variety of habitats and conveniently orchids can be broken down based on the way that they grow. And so some orchids are terrestrial, they come up from the woodland floor, the forest floor, or sandy areas, or boggy habitats. Some orchids are epiphytic, meaning they grow on host trees. Some orchids are lithophytic, meaning they grow on exposed rocks. And those are mainly found in the tropical areas. Here in North America, most of our orchids are terrestrial, like this one right here. So which orchid species is this? This is the showy Orchis, Galliera spectabilis. And Orchis is not a mispronunciation. There is a genus of orchids known as Orchis, mainly found in Europe and North Africa. And this species right here was thought to be a member of the Orchis genus, but this one was given a new genus by taxonomists in more recent times, relatively speaking. That is the Galliaris genus. Galliaris refers to the helmet-like appearance of the flowers, how the petals and sepals fuse together and form a hood on these flowering structures. And maybe you're familiar with Gallerina mushrooms. And Gallerina refers to the helmet-like appearance of the caps of those mushrooms. And Spectabilis refers to the spectacular or showy or notable appearance of this plant. So the showy orchis is very easy to positively identify. It has two fleshy oval-shaped basal leaves. These leaves begin to appear during the spring months and will last until autumn. From mid-April to mid-June, a flowering stalk is produced about four to six inches in length. And on this stalk are numerous white to pinkish lavender colored flowers that are each about an inch long. Each flower, as I mentioned before, contains a hood comprised of fused sepals and petals as well as a lower petal that is white and spurred. Now just because the showy orchis is easy to identify, it doesn't mean it's always easy to find. Let's go take a walk and see if we can find some more of these beautiful wildflowers. Okay, so about 100, 150 yards away from the original spot where I found the showy orchis, found another beautiful wildflower right here, another showy orchis. There's a couple scattered about this hillside. As you can see, it's much more green over here. It's a little harder to find this one, but I'm lucky that I did find it. And there's a couple more scattered about over there, some over there as well. So this is a prime habitat to find the showy orchis. Now the showy orchis grows throughout eastern North America and it has a broad distribution, though in some states it's considered to be rare. So you want to look in rich, moist, wooded areas that support a lot of spring wildflowers, including trillium, Dutchman's breeches, Solomon seal, golden seal, Virginia water leaf, dwarf ginseng, jack in the pulpit, and others. And you also want to look in areas with mature trees, both broadleaf and conifer trees. Where I am right now, I'm seeing a lot of tulip poplar trees, sugar maple trees, and eastern hemlock trees. Now the showy orchis is not considered to be rare here in Pennsylvania, but it's no surprise that many orchid species are considered to be rare in nature, occurring in restricted and specific niches and habitats. And a big reason for this is that many orchid species rely heavily upon the presence of mutualistic symbionts, including not only pollinators, but fungi. You see, the tiny seeds of orchids lack food reserves, and in order for an orchid to proceed with proper development, 
colonization by an appropriate fungus is necessary under natural conditions. Orchid species rely on their fungal associates for the acquisition of nutrients, at least during the non-photosynthetic protocorm stage of development. And just as a side note, a protocorm is a tiny structure that forms after an orchid seed germinates. Now in some cases, orchid species rely on fungi for the acquisition of nutrients throughout their entire lives. Most orchids, however, do become photosynthetic as adults and are no longer entirely dependent on their mycorrhizal fungi for nutrients. However, the roots of adult terrestrial orchids, including those of the showy orchis, are still consistently heavily colonized by mycorrhizal fungi. Now it was thought for a long time, and it's still often reported, that this relationship between fungus and orchid is unidirectional, with the fungus supplying the nutrients to the orchid in exchange for basically nothing. And this thinking was based on research conducted primarily in the 1970s and 80s. Newer research, however, conducted in 2006 and 2008, suggests otherwise, as the results of these more recent studies found that orchids do indeed transfer carbon over to their fungal associates rather than hoarding it all. To me, this makes sense because it's a bit difficult, at least in my opinion, to imagine that the fungus would not receive anything at all, whether this anything can be measured or not, in exchange for the good work it's doing to benefit the orchid. So it's nice to see these more recent studies corroborating this feeling. And although we've been largely talking about mycorrhizal fungi that form associations with orchid species, saprophytic fungi, including those in the Merasmius, Mycena, and Armillaria genera, do provide nutrients to many orchid species. Now one more thing about the showy orchis. We talked about Galliaris meaning helmet, Spectabilis meaning notable or showy. Where does the name orchid come from? Well, it comes from the ancient Greek word orchis, which literally means testicle in reference to the shape of the tubers of some orchid species. Let's go see if we can find another beautiful and lovely wildflower. Right over here is another beautiful and lovely wildflower that I absolutely love finding every single year. I love seeking it out. Many times I come to the woods just looking for this plant. This is a wild gentian. It belongs to the gentian family. The gentian family encompasses far fewer species than the orchid family, so about 1,600 or so species in the gentian family. Although we have a lot of gentians here in North America, species diversity reaches its greatest in East Asia, specifically in China. So which gentian is this? Well, this is Virginia pennywort, Obelaria virginica. So where does Obelaria come from? Well, it comes from the Greek word obelis, which was a small coin used in ancient times. And it seems that Linnaeus thought that these small reduced leaves, these rounded leaves, look like coins. So he gave it the name Obelaria. And then virginica means of Virginia, probably in reference to where this plant was first described. And in Linnaeus's time, Virginia encompassed much more land than it currently does today. So Virginia pennywort, Obelaria virginica. So this plant is easily identified. Nothing really looks like Virginia pennywort in the woods. Each plant is only a few inches tall, though some specimens can grow up to six inches in length. The reduced, rounded leaves are oppositely arranged, and they're typically greenish to greenish purple in color. The flowers of Virginia pennywort are quite tiny. They're whitish to purplish, and they're interspersed throughout the plant. Now, just because this plant is easily identified, that doesn't mean it's easy to find. Because of its smaller size and camouflaged colors, Virginia pennywort is easily overlooked. Just like we see with the showy orchis, Virginia pennywort is usually found in moist, shaded habitats in deciduous forests. Though unlike the showy orchis, Virginia pennywort is often covered almost completely by the dense, thick leaf litter. So if you scrape away some of the leaves, you'll often see Virginia pennywort hiding out in the leaf litter, and these hidden plants typically showcase fewer flowers than the plants that rise above the leaves. Now, Virginia pennywort seems to be most common in the mid-Atlantic portion of the United States, being most common in Virginia and North Carolina, but also in Kentucky, Tennessee, and West Virginia. It seems to reach its northern limit here in Pennsylvania, so I'm very lucky to be able to see this wildflower in the wild. Now, the majority of the 1,600 or so gentian species are fully autotrophic, 
meaning they use energy from the sun to convert water in the soil and carbon dioxide in the air into glucose. Now there are exceptions in the gentian family, including three non-chlorophyll containing and fully mycoheterotrophic genera that rely on fungi for all their nutrient and carbon needs. Virginia pennywort is an interesting species in the gentian family in that it seems to display characteristics of what is called partial mycoheterotrophy. So Virginia pennywort is not always fully autotrophic, and it does not seem to be fully mycoheterotrophic either. Partial mycoheterotrophs obtain large amounts of nutrients through photosynthesis, as well as from their fungal partners during the plant's adult life stages. Because of their reliance on fungi for a good portion of their nutrient needs, partial mycoheterotrophs often have leaves that are reduced in size, like we see here with Virginia pennywort. Partial mycoheterotrophs also typically demonstrate reduced root production as well. Now I'm not going to dig up this plant, though if we were to look at its root system, especially under magnification, we would see that Virginia pennywort has hairless coralloid roots, meaning these roots look like coral, and these roots are heavily colonized by fungi. These features, the reduced leaves, the hairless roots, and the coralloid appearance of the root system, all lend support to the theory that Virginia pennywort may be a partial mycoheterotroph that obtains nutrients through photosynthesis as well as from its fungal partners during its adult life. Pretty fascinating stuff, huh? I'm so glad that I found Virginia pennywort, and honestly the only reason that I saw it was because it was growing not too far away from the showy orchis. That's what often happens when you're exploring nature. You go out looking for one specific thing, only to come across a cornucopia of all different kinds of plants and mushrooms and trees that you never expected to find. So there we have it. We talked about the showy orchis, Galliaris spectabilis, we talked about Virginia pennywort, Obelaria virginica, an orchid species and a gentian species. Two beautiful plants that anybody could easily fall in love with. I hope you enjoyed walking around these woods with me just as much as I enjoyed showing you around these woods. If you want to stay in touch, feel free to subscribe to the Learn Your Land YouTube channel or head on over to learnyourland.com and sign up for the email newsletter. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.